from there. So thank you all for being here tonight with us. Uh, we'll see if a couple more people come in as we're getting started. But uh, I wanted to welcome you all to our November seminar, Winter Placemaking in Your Town. We're so happy to have you join us this evening. For those of you who are new here, Sullivan Renaissance was founded in 2000 by Sandra Gary to fulfill her mission of making Sullivan County a beautiful, vibrant, healthy place to live. What started as small grants for community groups to plant gardens and flowers has grown to three robust grant programs and a variety of grants to fund different projects from $500 to $350,000, plus an awesome volunteer and intern program, horticulture and technical assistance, and more. I'd like to give a shout out to my team members this evening that have joined us. Uh, we have Anne Louise Scandariato, Shannon Salento, Alan Carroll, and Carmela Hugo. I haven't seen, if I missed you, I'm sorry, I didn't see you yet. Okay. The civic engagement is one's community, in one's community, is a great way to keep the ball rolling towards improvements in public spaces and infrastructure, as well as a great way to meet your neighbors. We encourage residents to work with their municipalities on projects and initiatives that beautify the area, as well as bring more business to the area and empower people to engage in healthy behaviors. Selvin Catskills winters can be beautiful and are an opportunity to use public spaces differently. Public spaces can be used for a gathering all year round when the opportunity for fun in a comfortable setting is present. This evening we will hear from presenters who will help us consider strategies and resources from other cold weather regions in addition to what has been done in our own backyard to implement winter fun. Just one second here, of course. So to get started, let's meet the panel. Tonight we welcome Amanda O'Rourke, Executive Director of 880 Cities, which is based in Toronto. Cher Wall, Director of Town of Never Sink Parks and Recreation. Jackie Leventoff, Lead of Hurleyville Hub, a community group focused on creating activities to highlight all that the Hamlet has to offer. Each presenter shares a different experience from a particular perspective. Let's start with an overview from Amanda and then focus in on some specific projects with Cher and Jackie. During the presentations, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop them in the chat and we will be sure to get to them after the presentations. Amanda O'Rourke is the Executive Director of 880 Cities, a nonprofit organization with a mission to create healthy, equitable, and sustainable cities. She has over 17 years of experience in the nonprofit sector, leading strategic planning, partnership development, and managing high impact projects. She has led diverse equitable mobility and public space projects in cities and towns in North America, Europe, and Australia. She enjoys working collaboratively with city governments and community partners to make it easier for people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds to walk, bike, take transit, and build social connection and sense of belonging in public spaces. Amanda holds a Master of Science in Urban Planning from the University of Toronto and a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Biology from Queen's University. She's also the co-chair of the Children's Play and Nature Committee for World Urban Parks, an advisory board member for Healthy Places by Design. It's so good to have you with us, Amanda. Thank you so much for that warm welcome and lovely introduction. Uh, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna share some slides with you all today. And I'm gonna start big picture, thinking about winter and I love, uh, what you were saying about winter as an opportunity, because I absolutely agree. I think uh, part of 
what we've been doing at 880 Cities is, is trying to really change culture and mindset around winter uh, because winter is really special and can be a really fantastic asset in communities. Not everyone gets winter. So how do we celebrate it more through our public space design, programming and management? So I think you have to stop sharing your screen for me to be able to share mine. I'm so oh, perfect. Sorry. No worries, that's okay. Okay. So yeah, I'm gonna start really high level and share also some resources that we've done on winter cities and winter placemaking. Um, uh, this will be high level, but a lot of really great detail in a lot of uh, resources that I'll share at the end. Uh, so you already know who I am and uh, 880 Cities, as you heard, our mission is really to ignite action and challenge the status quo to create healthier, more equitable and sustainable cities for all people. Uh, we've been at this for about 17 years uh, and we are a nonprofit while we're based in, in Toronto. We do work internationally. And uh, the way that we advance our mission is by bringing people together to transform mobility and public space, because we believe that mobility and public space have a really important role to play to creating those healthier, more equitable and sustainable cities. We are guided by a very simple, but we think powerful question and philosophy. Uh, what if everything we did in our cities was great for an eight-year-old and an 80-year-old? We think if you start there, uh, you can create better cities for everyone. Uh, 880s is always our starting point. Uh, we understand that age is a universal human experience. We're all aging. We can all kind of think of an eight-year-old and an 80-year-old. Um, but we also know that it's just one dimension in how people in cities can experience inequity. And we recognize the multiple ways in which marginalization and oppression intersect depending on one's social location, your race, your gender, your uh, social status, your income, your ability. Um, these are all uh, part of our broader understanding and uh, around the 880 concept. 880 is always our starting point, not our end point, but it's a, it's a great way to open up broader discussions around equitable public space. We uh, are, are focused on kind of reclaiming the right to the city for everyone, cities and towns, communities of all sizes, even though cities in, is in our name, we actually work at all scales. We've done uh, our winter placemaking guide specifically was uh, a collaboration with the Rural Placemaking Lab with AARP. Uh, so this is really, uh, you know, reclaiming the right to uh, public space that has often been um, uh, dominated by uh, a focus on moving cars and less on the health and happiness of people. And this has had a disproportionate impact on, on children and older adults and low-income individuals, people with disabilities, racialized populations. So for the for us, uh, the ADD concept is this broad uh, a uh, concept to help us understand how we can create more equitable cities by reclaiming the right to mobility, safe and comfortable movement, uh, the right to public space, uh, you know, uh, the opportunity to have a high quality park and public space close to where you live, no matter your age, ability, income, status, and the right to participate, that everyone should be able to participate in uh, city building and community building decisions that affect them. So these are the three rights that sort of our organizing principles and what we focus on. So as you can tell, we really focus on the public realm, places, and, and placemaking as an anchor to support equity and social equity. So coming from Toronto, we know a little bit about winter. <laughs> uh, and uh, we know winter can also... Uh, be amazing and fantastic. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is a great example from, from Winnipeg. We're, uh, our team is uh, based in Toronto, but we have folks uh, who've lived in a lot of different Canadian cities with a lot of different types of winter. So Toronto is actually has a pretty mild winter by Canadian standards. Um, I think we're the uh, seen as the, the wimpiest <laughs> of cities when it comes to winter. Uh, but Ottawa, Montreal, Winnipeg, um, Edmonton, it, quite a diversity of how uh, different cities experience winter too. Um, and this is also something that we've highlighted in our placemaking guide. But one of the things, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, 
you know, we are really trying to reframe the conversation around winter uh, uh, and creating great public spaces in winter. And part of the challenge is that the mindset and negative uh, sort of attitude towards winter that we have seen is really because a lot of people experience this is the big experience they have with winter. So yeah, this is annoying. This is not nice or fun. Um, uh, but and we know that winter can pose a lot of challenges, especially when it comes to mobility, uh, when sidewalks are not maintained, uh, when bus stops are not maintained. Uh, it basically makes people feel like they're second class citizens in their own cities and towns. Uh, and, you know, you can feel sometimes like, you know, ah, my city really doesn't care about me as a person walking, uh, riding a bicycle or using public transit uh, in winter. So there's a, a lot more in a way, winter, thinking about that ADD lens and adding that winter lens, it makes us even more vulnerable. So we need to do better and need to do more. Uh, we don't need to, it, it doesn't mean we just give up. <laughs> it means we actually have to focus on on uh, doing even an even better job. We've also noticed uh, that in a lot of cities, especially in North America, there is this sort of um, mindset that the parks and the public spaces are unofficially closed in winter. That's actually something a city official told me uh, that they were very happy that, you know, in winter they don't have to pay the maintenance dollars and, uh, you know, garbage pickup and, and there's no maintenance of walkways. But what does this say about how we use our public assets, our parks and public spaces and our streets uh, should work all every day uh, throughout the year uh, and uh, can be uh, great public spaces if we actually put the time and energy and thoughtfulness into creating great winter destinations. Uh, so that includes maintenance, that includes, um, you know, great seating, it includes, a, you know, even on a, a the bottom picture, uh, there's a playground with not much else to do. It's a beautiful day, but people are not there. So we can clearly do better. And there's a lot of opportunity for uh, improving our public spaces, especially in winter. And so we've really been leading uh, the charge to try to activate public life in winter. And when I say public life, I'm talking about uh, community activity, really physical activity in public space, social interaction, uh, the opportunity to connect with nature and access to sunlight and fresh air. And we know that these are so important to our health and well-being. So why shouldn't we actually try to activate our public spaces in winter and create more of a culture of, of uh, winter public life? And uh, through... Uh, our winter placemaking guide that we published that was last year, um, we embarked on a journey to, to sort of define winter placemaking. There actually wasn't a definition out there that we found, so we actually created a, a definition and also highlight the really creative ways that communities have been doing winter placemaking. And uh, the wonderful thing that we found was that it was a lot of smaller communities that were really probably showing the most ingenuity and creativity in activating public spaces in winter. So uh, we winter place making, as we define it, is a means to re-envision the ways that public spaces are created and used in winter in order to foster social connection, physical activity, and the many benefits of a vibrant public realm all year round. Uh, the guide highlights uh, the many benefits of investing in winter placemaking, and that is uh, health benefits, economic benefits, and social benefits. Uh, I think these are probably benefits that people on this call uh, know about, but I encourage you to look uh, at the guide that has sort of more of the detailed research around uh, how winter placemaking can support health, well-being, uh, social, and economic benefits. So, uh, that's a little about winter placemaking, and I thought I would just uh, uh, get us started in thinking about different aspects uh, of winter placemaking, just to get our, our brains warmed up. And uh, when we were, we have been doing winter placemaking projects uh, and winter broader city strategy projects, uh, we've really thought about these four things uh, at the beginning uh, when we're thinking of uh, creating great winter public spaces. For us, uh, they need movement, spark, light, and warmth. And I think these are great, like, 
uh, frames to think about as you're thinking about implementing winter placemaking in your own town. By warmth, and I'm going to run through these really quickly. Warmth, uh, yeah, it's cold in winter, so we need places to warm up. Seems obvious, but it's amazing how many winter public spaces don't actually have anywhere to warm up. It could be even access to an indoor space, which is great. That's what we've heard from communities as well. But it's nice to have winter um, public spaces where you can go inside to warm up when it's really cold. Access to fires. We actually have a whole tool on our uh, Winter Cities Toolkit about how to get a fire permit going in your uh, community. It's possible. There's lots of communities that have done it, but there is a process to navigate to get fire pits and parks and in uh, plazas and public spaces. Food is, an, is a fantastic warming agent. Uh, so uh, access to warm food uh, is a, a great way to build warmth uh, for your winter place making project. Uh, we also had this great example for a project we were doing in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Uh, and they found that through the engagement, a lot of folks said that they didn't actually have access to warm gear and the proper gear to do outside activity. So they partnered with uh, the Parks and Recreation Department, uh, partnered with the library to offer gear share, um, which is a great example of increasing warmth and, and uh, accessibility. Uh, it can be things like pop-up saunas uh, that can also uh, increase warmth and get people outside and active. Uh, so think about warmth when you're thinking about uh, winter placemaking. You know, we kind of have to get beyond this mentality that like, oh, you got to toughen up. It's okay. You know, this is a, you know, endure winter. Uh, winter can be a warm time of year as well. The second is movement. When we're thinking about uh, public space, moving our bodies is really great uh, for uh, keeping people outside longer. Uh, if you're moving your bodies, you're warming yourself up. So simple things like creating walkable uh, districts and, of course, uh, having good maintenance of, uh, of uh, footpaths. Um, really thinking creatively about uh, design that is playful and fun, uh, move it that encourage people, encourages people to move their bodies is a great uh sort of principle for winter placemaking. Uh, bicycling can happen in winter. We know that there's uh, really fantastic examples uh, in, in Europe. This is Copenhagen. Uh, in Ulu, Finland, they've done some really fantastic work around uh, all-year uh, bikeways. Uh, and simple things like uh, yoga classes or Zumba, you know, you do that in summer, you can still do that in winter, you just got to bundle up. But programming can happen in winter as well. So think about movement as you're thinking about activating public spaces. The fourth uh, idea is using light. Uh, so winter is also dark. Uh, our, our wonderful partners in Edmonton uh, talked a lot about their winter strategy and while they couldn't predict a lot of snow, so they always said that, you know, all these wonderful winter pictures have snow in it. We don't always can predict snow, but we can predict the darkness. Uh, and uh, using light to animate public space is a great way to uh, encourage that public life that we're talking about. And there's been some really creative ideas beyond light is like, you know, there is um, these community garden uh, um, competitions that happen in the summer. And in Edmond, did, they did uh, front yards and bloom winterscapes. So you can do something like that that activates uh, neighborhoods as well. In Leadville, Colorado, they actually have uh, an incentive for houses to get painted bright colors, which is also a kind of play of light. They get lots of snow in Leadville, and this is a great way to like uh, sort of bring that lightness uh, to dark um, winters. There's also wonderful examples of broader uh, art installations. Uh, you know, uh, why not have uh, li lighted up seesaws? That sounds fun. Uh, or these uh, winter lights. Uh, these are SAD lights uh, to raise awareness about um, seasonal affective disorder. So that was my third one. And the last one is Spark. So uh, Spark is really thinking about activating community and leveraging community assets. So it's that creativity that people bring to activating winter. What a great example, using a 
a downtown street as a tobogganing hill, uh, you know, having a snowball fight, uh, doing outdoor winter concerts, art installations, uh, having markets, uh, doing something as simple as as uh, painting the snow on an ice rink so that everybody can get involved. Uh, these are the four sort of things I wanted to get your mind going as you think about winter placemaking. And I just wanted to uh, connect you with this winter placemaking guide. I will enter the, um, the link in the chat so you can access the guide. It's a free downloadable guide that we did in partnership with AARP. And it actually goes step by step on how to do winter placemaking and has some really concrete specific examples specifically in, in rural communities and smaller communities that have done some lighter, quicker, cheaper interventions in uh, public space. In addition to the winter placemaking guide, we have this Winter Cities Toolkit, uh, which is a product of a partnership with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, it, as a way to address social isolation, we uh, worked with three cities across the U.S. to test out some ideas on winter placemaking and strategize on how to uh, develop winter policies. Uh, so that uh, link is also here on this slide, which is cut off, so I will enter it into the chat as well. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much for the opportunity to share some ideas and get your minds going and thinking about winter in a new way. And I'll stop sharing and, and I'll look forward to the panel. Thank you so much, Amanda. I can uh, say that our colleague, Anne Louise, who's on the call with us this evening, actually saw the, um, the information in AARP and shared it with us before we knew about 880 cities, I think. So um, it's getting out there. <laughs> so. Thank you for That's doing great to that. hear. Yeah. So uh, we're going to go back now. We're going to chat with Cher. She's going to share with us uh, that she was the is the director of the Town of Neversink Parks and Rec Department, which was established in December of 2005. The purpose of the department is to provide quality park, recreation, and public facilities for every resident of the Town of Neversink and entities engaged in agreements with the Town of Neversink, which includes the students of the Tri-Valley Central School District and the Town of Denning. The department strives to enhance the town's natural beauty and coordinate recreation, leisure, and athletic activities that promote positive community values. The Parks and Rec Department is continuing to provide youth with the programs that have they have enjoyed in the past and are also expanding programs and events for our adult population in the town of Neversink. Cher is originally from Buffalo and then moved to Sacramento, California, where she worked for 35 years for the state of California before moving back to New York. She has worked with Sullivan Renaissance in a variety of town beautification projects, served as the general superintendent for the Gramsville Little World's Fair from 2016 to 2019, and participated in the Daniel Pierce Library Time and the Valleys Museum boards for all before being appointed as the director of Parks and Rec for the town in July of 2020. Welcome, Cher. Thank you, Christy, and thank you, thank you, everyone. And my first question is, do I have to scroll through these slides or do you do that, Christy? I will do that for you. <laughs> on, the, on the screen. Yep, I got it. I guess, good, because, you know, I, I can tell you I'm not technical, but, but anyway, thank you very much for having me. And I would like to take this time to share with you um, how our little town in Neversink came about getting a community ice rink and all the things we went through to get it and how much it's benefited our community um, and how much the community has benefited the rink. Um, first and foremost, as Christy says, I got appointed to the position of deputy for Parks and Rec in 2020. And one of the first things I did with the, the team I had was to try and look at new events and activities to bring to our town to our community, uh, you know, more so than bus trips, but things in the community. One of the uh, members told me that years ago, they used to have an ice rink 
at the fairgrounds. However, it was dependent on mother nature keeping its ice frozen. So when I went to our town board and said, this is a great idea, what could we do? They suggested we look into purchasing self-contained portable refrigerated ice rink, uh, one of those, and bring it to the town and possibly create a rink. Well, that's how the journey on getting that ice rink to never sink was started. What, what happened then is, of course, I researched all kinds of companies to find a rink and was able to obtain approval for a 32 foot by 60 foot ice rink, self-contained, portable, refrigerated, that we put at the fairgrounds, at our pavilion, and um, opened it up for that, you know, in um, December of 2020. Now we got that rink through a company called Iron Sleeks, and you'll understand why that's important when I talk a little bit more about our expansion. But that rink the first year was such a great success. We had over 800 people coming to that rink skating on the days that we were open and the evenings we were open. But the one thing we realized at the end of our season is that a 32 by 60 foot rink is too small for a community. We found that a, a rink being 32 feet wide did not afford space for new skaters to have a place to learn to skate while the experienced skaters were zipping up and down the rink. It was not safe. It was also very intimidating for these poor new skaters. We also realized that a rink that size only allowed a, approximately 30 to 35 skaters on it where they could skate comfortably, actually be skating. It's, it was too small for a community. So we proceeded with requesting and getting approval to expand our ice rink, to double it in size. And with the help of Sullivan Renaissance, we obtained a healthy community grant. Thank you so much. And our town board, that next season, December 2021, we opened up a rink that was 52 by 60 feet. It doubled the actual skating surface. And it was an incredible success. Oh, and there you go. That's the, on the screen is the skinny rink. And later on, you'll see, which I'm going to speak to now, what's involved with actually doing a rink. It's great to get one, but what do you have to do when you finally get it? Well, first and foremost, you have to install it. And to install an ice rink, you have to make sure that number one, you got level ground and you, you have to put up, as you can see on the screen there, all the walls get put up. And then once the walls are put up, you have to lay all of the mats. You have to put the liner for the ice and then all of these mats that have these, this tubing and piping through it that takes your glide call through the ice to keep it frozen. And then you have to go ahead and connect everything as that picture shows. It's all connected to that big chiller, which keeps the ice constantly frozen up to 55 or 60 degrees. So all of that, and then you have to test and make sure there are no leaks in all those tubes that your glycol isn't going to leak. That takes us about five to seven days to do all of that. It's not full time, but it takes about five to seven days. Once that's all done, you got to make sure all your little mats and everything kind of like that get warm and lay out perfectly straight. They can't have buckles in them, et cetera, because they're going to be the base of your ice. When they're all warmed and nice and smooth, then you're ready to make your ice. And your ice is made in layers, in intervals. You, 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 know, you spray um, half an inch to an inch of water on there, let it freeze. Do another layer, let it freeze. And you do up to, our rink is up to four inches in depth. Um, some maybe less, some maybe more, but ours is four inches. And so that takes about three to four days also. Once that's done, and it's gotta be clean water. I wanna add that. It has to be clean water. It can't be water from a stream. Um, once that's done and your ice is beautiful and smooth, you're now ready to open your rink. However, once your rink is open, you better be ready to maintain that ice. And what, what that entails is, you see how nice and smooth that ice is, it hasn't been skated on. Well, as soon as you have skaters on that ice, you shave up that ice. After every single session we have on our ice rink, 
we have to scrape the ice shavings off the ice and get them out of there so they do not freeze to that ice overnight. Otherwise, it's dangerous. So every session, we scrape, we sweep. And I'll tell you, what I found most interesting is our littlest kids on the ice, you know, five, six-year-old kids, look forward to grabbing those six-foot-long um, scrapers to help scrape our ice and get it all clean and smooth. They love it. it, it it's, it's fun to watch. But anyway, you also, two to three times a week, you have to run the Zamboni on that ice to ensure that you get the deep, you know, the deep divots smoothed out. And you also have to add additional layer of water to freeze a new layer of ice to maintain the four inches. So that's what it takes to maintain the ice. Now, what's it take to actually monitor and manage the rink during open sessions? We need, you know, people there to actually make sure the rules that we have for our ice rink, which we plagiarized the National Ice Rink Association rules and built rules for our rink, that those rules are adhered to. For example, you have to wear a helmet on our rink. No ifs, ands, or buts. And you have to skate in one direction. No ifs, ands, or buts. So we need someone there monitoring to ensure the rules are adhered to. They also, um, they also distribute skates and get them back in, you know, take them, you know, hand them out, take them in, register them in and out and sanitize them. We have a lot of skates that we loan to people during the sessions, the free. They, they don't, you don't have to pay for any of this. And they also make sure they, they keep tally of who comes to our rink because at the end of each season, we do an evaluation. How many people came to the rink? What kind of age group? Were they from our town or outside of our town? Um, and then they also do the key things. They open that rink, open, turn on the lights, and they close it. And closing it means that that rink is scraped clean. And then they can shut it down. And then it's ready for the next session after the Zamboni goes through it. So you can see it. It, it may seem like a lot of work to do an ice rink, um, but it really isn't. When you look at the value it adds to the community and when you look at what the community has added to our rink. I mean, when we have this ice rink open, it's incredible because you see families and friends coming at certain times during the week, always there, just sharing time with each other, skating and visiting, making new friends. You see a place where people come to exercise. If you don't have a lot of places to exercise in winter, this gave our community a place to actually exercise. We even have um, a little, uh, friend, uh, I call her my little lady friend from Monticello. She comes every single week for an hour and a half on that rink to get her, you know, and she's been doing it for the two years where we've been open. Um, it gave a, uh, an opportunity for our older students at the school. They didn't have have a lot to do in winter so they'd kind of get in trouble hang around and punch out on their their telephones all the time they came to the rink and these kids came every single week they met friends there they learned to skate they helped us clean up the rink so it, it gave them an outlet and an opportunity which which was great um it also it also gave, gave um i want to say um the school organizations it gave them the opportunity to raise funds because they run all of the concession stands. We don't, they do, and they earn funds for their organization. So you can see how the ice rink gave to our community. But I think the most important thing is what the community gave to the ice rink. This ice rink is truly a community ice rink. It is 100% managed and maintained by volunteers in our community. All those tasks I, I said you had to do, those are done by people from our community. So they own this rink and they take pride in it. And they're, they literally ensure that it is one of the best places to come, especially during winter. And they open the doors to everyone, not just our community, but people outside the community. They donate all the skates. We've gotten skates and helmets. All of our equipment is donated from our community and from people outside of the community. And we even have um, a gentleman in our community that donates his time to sharpen the skates every two, every other week, I think he comes for a couple days. 
and sharpens the skates. So you can see that, um, and we're open based on what's on the screen. You can see we're open quite a bit during the week. Um, so you can see that this is truly a, 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 an ice rink that is owned by the community, managed by the community, and gives back to the community because it gives them something to do during the winter months. Um, with that, you know, that gives you an idea of our rink, but there's a couple of things I did want to share. In the event you are thinking of doing an ice rink, we learned a lot of lessons that first year, let me tell you. But two very key ones that I wanted, really wanted to share is number one, your rink needs to be under cover. The Hallmark movies are beautiful, all that snow flow, you know, coming down on the rink and it looks great. But when you're trying to skate and it's freezing, no, you, you can't because you've got that snow on there. You've got to scrape it off. So try and put it under cover on level ground. And if you have the ability um, to um, keep it up all year, we put ours up and take it down. If you have the ability to keep it in a spot to keep it up all year, do that. The other thing is make sure your rink is, um, is the right size for your community. Our first rink wasn't, but we expanded and it is. It, it gave the opportunity for new skaters and experienced skaters. And Christy's got something on the screen that I totally forgot about that I wanted to mention. Thank you. Um, the, the ice rink also gave us uh, an opportunity for other events. For example, and you saw a picture earlier, we had a disco night where the rink was all lit up with all the disco colors and we played disco music. And I'm telling you, old and young alike all had a ball. We have a winter fest where we open the rink for the whole winter fest in February. Last year's winter fest, we had over 250 people on that skating rink during that event. So it gave, and we have more items planned for the upcoming year, different things that we want to do focused around our ice rink. It also gave us, and this speaks um, to what was said earlier, it also took something that is never used, has never been used, the fairgrounds, and we all of a sudden opened it up and made it usable. And that, that is, a, is a great thing for our, our town. So anyway, that's our ice rink in a nutshell. And thank you for listening. And hopefully if there's any questions, I'll be able to answer them. Thank you so much, Cher. I think it uh, gave everyone a good idea of all the work that uh, it takes to get that ice rink going and keep it maintained. So now uh, I will introduce Jackie Leventoff. Jackie is a licensed real estate realtor and real estate investor in Sullivan County, Catskills region of New York. Her company, Do Over Real Estate, specializes in the redevelopment of residential property to welcome new families to vibrant neighborhoods. Her position as the former president and CEO of the Selvin County Chamber of Commerce and Industry gives Jackie a unique insight in the characteristics and strengths of each Selvin County community. The Selvin County Catskills is only 90 minutes from the George Washington Bridge and it has long been the playground to the metropolitan New York area, which lends itself to working with those looking for a second home or those who want to trade the hustle of the city for the sa safety and relaxation of the Catskills. Jackie has worked with many nonprofit associations throughout the years and currently serves on the board of many county organizations. Her current resume includes Mid-Hudson Regional Economic Development Council voting member, Selvin County Land Bank Vice Chair, Selvin Waworsing Reap Zone Vice Chair, Selvin County Chamber Foundation Board member, and Selvin Renaissance Steering Committee member. Jackie is a lifelong resident of the town of Fallsburg, where she is committed to raising her family and working for the benefit of the community. We're so glad to have you with us, Jackie. Thanks so much, Christy. Thanks great for the great introduction. Um, I also have several members of the Hurleyville Hub, and we are a, a group, not really formal organized group of people just interested in helping Hurleyville grow and develop. So 
I welcome all of my, my board members or my, my team members, as we call them, um, to jump in at any time if I miss something. Um, Hurleyville festivals generate community pride and business. And that's the reason we started it, um, the festivals. It's just to bring people into Hurleyville, <clears throat> excuse me, have some kind of events into the town of Fallsburg. We have a lot of summer visitors and we just want people to know that Hurleyville is a great hamlet and that we have a lot to offer there. So we've developed four festivals for the year. Two we have in the summer, one in July and one in August. Um, we do a scare, did a Scarecrow Festival this past September, I mean, uh, October, beginning of October. And the pictures on the, the screen now are from last year's Winterfest, which we call Holiday in Hurleyville. And it's coming up on December 3rd. And we're really excited about the, the events for this year. Um, as you see, Chrissy, can you go back a couple of slides? Sure. So, great. So um, we are uh, inclusive. We have a lot of events. We, we welcome anyone. So Messy Church is a church in town. It's the Methodist Church, and they have a community group. We have the menorah. We have different uh, ways to celebrate the entire community in Hurleyville. Okay, next one. So our festivals, we have basically made very children-centric. We want to bring families. We want to bring good, wholesome fun and get people out to just enjoy themselves. So we have done a, a great job, and if I do say myself ourselves, um, bringing town uh, families to our town and having them either walk through our town through scavenger hunts, um, things that would excite the children it, uh, during our Scarecrow Fest. We had a pumpkin decorating table. Messy Church did that for us. So we have a lot of things to do, but we always focus on the children. So this is uh, the, the cheerleaders last year did a bake sale at our at our uh, last year holiday in Hurleyville. That is our flyer from last year. So we are really gearing up for this year's. We just had a great uh, call right before this. And we have a lot of things. And thank you so much, Amanda, for your, your thoughts and, and things that we, we can do. Because I think we have a, a lot of things to offer in Hurleyville. One of the things Hurleyville has to offer is we are a mobility town. So we have the Center for Discovery and New Hope Community right down the road. So a lot of our town is centered around people either in wheelchairs or have mobility issues. So we our sidewalks are flatter um, by design. So mobility is something really that we latch onto and we make sure that we talk about very often. We also have um, the Move Sullivan truck that comes, van that comes through town. And it's the countywide transportation service. And it goes right through the middle of Hurleyville. So it also gives us an opportunity to bring people to Hurleyville through that, van, through that mode. Um, this is our Scarecrow Festival. And similar to what we did in the Scarecrow Festival for our December 3rd festival, we're gonna do a Snow People and Creatures Festival. So we're going to have businesses and the homes create snow creatures or, or uh, snow people. Um, if there isn't any snow, they can make it out of foam, garbage bags, be creative. So we want snow people and snow creatures to pop up all over our, our little hamlet of Hurleyville. So people will go from snow creature, snow person to person, take pictures, post them on Instagram, and every time they post a photograph, they're going to be entered into a drawing to win a, uh, the Hurleyville Halls, we've called it. So restaurants have given gift certificates and um, movie theater has given tickets. And our bike shop has given free rentals of either snowshoes or a bicycle rental. So we have a lot of people donating to that. Our whole point was to get people to post onto the social media to hype Hurleyville and people to come downtown and see, or through our hamlet, to see what we have to offer there. Um, we have partnered with the Chamber of Commerce. And so we are being an un official group, there was no mechanism for us to gain funds. So if we can share anything with people is to partner, don't do it alone. It's the partnerships that are so important. So the chamber is a huge partner of ours and they have collected our funds for our vendors. They have, um, we've applied for a county grant 
to help us put these festivals on. And they were the conduit for that, keeping our accounting and being the, the bookkeeper, the uh, extraordinaire, the point of contact for us, which gave us legitimacy that we needed. Not that, you know, we are a group of business people and residents and organizations within Hurleyville, but we don't have that central place and the chamber gave it that to us. So it was invaluable in the development of the events. Plus they do have their vendors. They do street fairs and different things throughout the year. So they also have the vendor list that we partnered with them and they send out information to all of their vendors about our, our programs to get those vendors in. So instead of recreating the wheel, we just join their bandwagon. Um, so our key learnings, um, we start early. There's no such thing as too much promotion. So again, we just had our meeting an hour ago regarding our holiday in Hurleyville, but we've already chosen our dates for all of 2023, uh, which is really important for vendors to get it on their calendar at a time so they can plan for it, that they can commit to us early. We can give them a discount if they do all four of our events. So that's the way we're thinking about promoting it and doing it early. Share resources with others and work for organizations with vendor lists, insurance information. Um, I would love to hear from Cher how she, how the liability works um, with the town of Neversink because I know that is a huge call out. Uh, you know, we have to have certificates of insurance. Everybody has to name the town of Fallsburg as their an additional insured. And so I would love to know how that works within the town. Um, be inclusive, involve all aspects of the community, residents, the business and organizations. Again, we have specifically focused on the youth in our community. And the last, for the Scarecrow Festival, we do have a, it's called the Main Street Dance, it's a dance studio. And they did a dance ex expo in the middle of our Scarecrow Festival, brought all the families out and, and we're doing it again for our holiday in Hurleyville event. They're gonna do it indoors, but again, all the families, it's just another way of bringing people because when the kids in the dance expo, mom and dad and grandma, tend to come. So it's another way to bring people out. Um, we have found picking a theme and building the event around a theme is much easier for us to plan. So our two summer festivals did not have a general theme other than summer festival, but our Scarecrow Festival had a general theme. And so we carried that through. So that's why we're doing uh, for December, a snow people theme. And to bring that, all the holiday in Hurleyville is a theme unto itself, but we're gonna do snowmen and elves and, and keep that theme going. Um, plan for weather and postponements. We are a rain or snow or shine events, but uh, we did have backup plans. And, and I saw on the, the thing for Hurley, for um, Neversink, that you have a blizzard date. And, and those things are really important is to plan for all, uh, contingencies, and also to plan for bathrooms, first aid, lost and found. Um, a lot of events, you know, people come, it's like, okay, where's the bathroom? Ooh, uh, we haven't thought about that. So we are very fortunate in Hurleyville that we have the Hurleyville Performing Arts Center right in the middle of our town. They are a wonderful partner. Um, and they open up their lobby and they, we utilize their bathrooms. Um, we have first aid in the town. We have Mobile Medic, which is a first aid company. And they have stay up on call for us if we need it. And we also have a, a table for lost and found. People drop stuff off all the time. Again, it's just a matter of making it good for your attendees to come to your town. So it's comfortable, you feel welcome. And we're also prepared to make it a great experience when they're in Hurleyville. So um, I don't know if the raised hand feature is activated, Christy, but I know that some of my, my people, my, the, my partners, my teammates from Hurleyville Hub are on and they may have something to add. Sure, anybody can take themselves off mute and um, go ahead and add to what Jackie's saying if they'd like. Okay, um, I love the idea of yoga outside. I think that we have a, a great opportunity. We have an amazing yoga studio right in the middle of town. So I love that idea, Amanda. Thank you so much, I'm stealing that. Um, and front yards in bloom with your winterscapes. Also love that. And I think that's gonna go well with our whole uh, snow people and snow creatures 
theme. So we're also stealing that. Hi, I'm Denise. I'm in Haraleville also. Um, great job, Jackie. Uh, in addition to um, everything that Jackie said, similar to the town of Neversink, we picked we picked a central location that's already drawing people in, and that's a little park. So um, playground, basketball courts, and it has some uh, a great town parking lot, and that's what we close down and use for vendors and festivals in the summertime. So it's very central. It's right in the middle of town, and um, it's it's easy to find. Great point, Kathleen. Uh, Denise, thank you so much. And what was really interesting for us is, especially for planning the winter event, we are trying to find vendor spaces in, on the indoors, which we which worked out actually wonderful for us because Hurleyville is very long. So we have partnered with either empty st stores that have empty space, or we, there's an art gallery that's clearing space for us. The, the Hurleyville Performing Arts Center has an art gallery. They're clearing space from vendors. So we're not gonna have 30 vendors in one location. We're gonna have 10 vendors in three separate locations. So people will walk from place to place. And we're also going to have a story, a strolling storytelling. So someone will start the Grinch who stole Christmas at one location and everyone will walk to the next location and somebody else will read the next 10 pages. And then they'll walk to the next location and another elf will read the next 10 pages. So they'll be walking through town, ending at the Sullivan County Museum with the tree lighting. They have a tree, uh, community trees is what they call it. People decorate trees at the museum and we're gonna end there. So again, we're trying to bring people throughout our Hamlet and again, not, not contrary to the cities, we are very rural here. The you know, same thing as Neversink. You have to drive to get to us. Um, so we make the best of that and we don't have a huge population. So in the winter time, Sullivan County has 75,000 people and it's not a whole lot of people. And we just want to bring people to the community, but also give them something to do and a reason to walk around our town. And it goes to the mobility, getting people out. And, and similar to Never Sink, people gather and they have, a, they have a great time doing it. Thank you so much, Jackie. That sounds awesome. Pleasure. I hope to stop by on December 3rd myself. Does anyone have any questions that uh, we can address uh, before uh, we end for the evening? I just have one question for Cher. Cher, how much did your skating rink cost? And did you get a grant? I, you said Sullivan Renaissance gave you a grant, but there, did you receive any other funds? The, um, the, skate, the original rink, the small one, um, cost uh, total about $51,000, the majority of that being the chiller. And we had that money. It was right during COVID time. So we had the money available because Parks and Rec was unable to do anything during COVID. So the money was there in the budget and we didn't get any grants or anything for the original rink. The expansion, yes, we got Sullivan Renaissance Healthy Community Grant. We redirected money from part of the Parks and Rec funding um, and the town came in and supported it um, and the expansion um, the actual expansion materials were sixteen thousand dollars because we didn't have to get a whole new rink but then we had to buy a new chiller uh, an additional chiller we wanted to get a bigger chiller but it was during the time that would have taken a year to get it because everything was taking so long so we ended up buying another 10 ton chiller and that was 21,000 to, to support the bigger rink because the smaller rink had a 10 ton chiller. We needed a 20 ton. So, so all in all, what, 75, yeah, it's been years since I've done math, but it's about 75,000 or so for the whole thing. So, And where'd you get the Zamboni? The Zamboni is donated from one of our community members. Yeah. All right, Sam, I'll take you out. Um, it, 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 from one of our community members, he donated the Zamboni. Um, so yeah, pretty cool. I'm going to have to just skip for a second. I have a dog that's trying to go outside sure. and I better let him out, but I'll be right back. Thank you, sure. All right.
Does anyone else have any other uh, questions or comments before we finish up for tonight? It was so good to see you all, and it, I hope you enjoyed yourselves as much as I did. Uh, we have our next seminar coming up on Wednesday, December 7th at 6 p.m., Intersections of Housing and Health. Uh, it's for planning and zoning board members, and they'll receive one and a half credit hours, but it's open to everyone. If that's a topic you'd like to learn more about, please feel free to uh, register with us. Uh, we'll have that next registration up very soon. Uh, other than that, please uh, connect with us if you haven't already. Um, I can be reached at Christy at SullivanRenaissance.org. Otherwise, uh, we have a, a web page, a Facebook page. Uh, we, we have a YouTube where it has uh, recordings of past programming that we have done. If you'd like to go back and look at something, and uh, this recording will be posted there in a few days. Any final?